So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my good, good friend, Tucker Hyatt from Wonderfest. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Science of Deception. My name is Tucker Hyatt. I'm the founding director of Wonderfest, the nonprofit Bay Area beacon of science. Uh, the Wonderfest mission has four parts. We inspire curiosity, promote careful reasoning, challenge unexamined beliefs, and encourage lifelong learning. If you can get behind those ideas, think about checking out Wonderfest, wonderfest.org online. I want to thank Kathy and the Cameo Cinema so much. This place is a beautiful venue for good movies, for good science, and some good magic today as well. I also want to thank the Bay Area Science Festival. This is one of the many Bay Area Science Festival events. The festival began uh, on Thursday and will continue through November 11th. Please check it out online if you want to find out what other great science events are happening in the next two weeks or, or so. All right, it's my honor to introduce your three deceivers for the day. The first, the first deceiver is a, an outstanding physicist and physics teacher. He is a former Albert Einstein Distinguished Education Fellow at the National Science Foundation. He is co-director of the Exploratorium Leadership Program. And best of all, he is the ringmaster of the physics circus. Please welcome Zeke Kossover. So before I started working at the Exploratorium, I was a high school physics teacher for 21 years. And in all of that time, I only wanted my school to give me one thing. I wanted a pool table. Because a pool table shows excellent physics, but they would never give me one. So I finally reconciled myself to not having the prop I really, really wanted. And they, uh, you know, I became OK with it. One day, though, in the student cafeteria, there was a ping pong table. Like a ping pong table? And so I went to the principal and said, why did you buy a ping pong table for the students. And you know, I've been asking for a pool table for years. And they said, ping pong tables are safer than pool tables. <laughs> you can throw a pool ball at someone, but you can't hurt someone with a ping pong ball. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> it's important to realize what's safe and what's not safe. We live in a world where we try to make everything really, really frightening. Like, maybe you could hit someone with a pool cue. I mean, after all, it happens in the movies, so it must be something that we need to be worried about with students. But when we use a, a ping pong table, they were sort of right. It is actually hard to hurt someone with a ping pong ball. Um, a ping pong ball, for its size, has a lot of air resistance. Even if I were to throw it at you as hard as I could, or smash it with the ping pong paddle, maybe I was amazing and got it going 60 miles an hour. Within 10 feet, it's going less than 30 miles an hour. The reason is, is like I said, for its size, it has lots and lots of air resistance. And so that got me thinking one day. If the problem with using a ping pong ball as a weapon is that it has a lot of air resistance, then the solution to that problem is getting rid of the air. <laughs> and that's what this is. So let me show you as I said it. Let me explain how this works as I set it up. Um, this is a vacuum cannon. So I'm going to put the ping pong ball in. And then I'm going to seal up the ends. So I'm going to seal up this end with a piece of mylar. This is just the same stuff that they use for emergency blankets or balloons. Uh, I did get it from the Exploratorium. So with any luck today, they will not have an earthquake and be missing one piece of emergency blanket. And so I'm going to pull it tight, and then I will seal up this side.
And then I'll do the same thing down here. No tricks, nothing yet. And now I have a can, and I'm going to put it right here because I don't like to miss. <laughs> and if I put it way over here, it wouldn't be vindictive because the ping pong ball slows down so fast. Now, if you were going to, my idea for this ping pong ball cannon has spread, and other people, in fact, had already had the idea before me as well. Um, and if you go online and see explanations about how this works, they're mostly full of lies. <laughs> They'll tell you that their cannon is going 800, 900, 1,000 miles an hour when it leaves the end. And I guess those all sound very impressive, but it can't actually be going faster than the speed of sound which is 720 miles an hour. So I don't understand why the exaggeration. It's perfectly fine with 720 miles an hour. Um, and so you might be wondering, how is it going to be going so fast? Well, so when I turn on the vacuum pump, the air is going to be drawn out of it. You'll be able to tell that that's happening because you'll see the ping pong ball roll this way. When the, all of the air is uh, out, I'll puncture the end with this pair of scissors and air will rush into the tube. So the tube has a cross-sectional area of about three square inches, and atmospheric pressure is about 14.7 pounds per square inch. So about 45 pounds is gonna push on three and a half grams of ping pong ball. Those are mixed units, but none of you all care. <laughs> <laughs> and the ping pong ball will start going faster and faster. But because there's no air resistance, it can get going really fast. And so when it gets to the end down there, it's going to be going the speed of sound, because that's the fastest the air can rush into the tube. Um, and then we'll get to see what happens to that poor defenseless can down there. <laughs> One warning, it's loud. Okay, It's not deafeningly loud. I've actually measured the, 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 the loudness of it with a, with a sound meter. Um, but it's loud enough that you might want to put your hands over your ears. And the second thing is, is that people who are not in this room might be surprised by the loud sound. <laughs> if I didn't warn them what I was going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick countdown. Three, two, one. They'll hear all of us to say it. We're all going to say it together. They won't know what's going to happen, but they'll know something's going to happen. <laughs> Are you all with me so far? Yeah. All right. And you'll know I'm closed because I'll close this valve. I'll tell you to count. Then I'll puncture the end, and we'll see what happens. All right, ready? Here comes the ping pong ball. Ready? Three, two, one, zero. activity at the start of the school year usually solved any sort of uh, uh, trouble in my classroom. <laughs> so the next thing I want to show you is uh, right here. Uh, this is about 30 pounds of broken glass. <coughs> now, how many people here have seen someone lay down on a bed of nails? Huh? On TV. On TV. <laughs> That's fine. So lying down on a bed of nails is a classic of the physics genre. So much so that when I bring it to show, people are not impressed by it anymore. 
So I moved up to broken glass. <laughs> Convince her. Ouch. <laughs> so the thing to remember about broken glass is it actually works the same way as a bed of nails. You want to not step on one piece of broken glass. You know, when you step on the glass, if you step on lots of pieces of broken glass, the force of your weight is spread out over your, uh, all the pieces that you're stepping on top of. And so each piece of glass, each edge, doesn't have that much weight on it. And that's what makes it safe. So I'm not advocating not cleaning up glasses that you break at your house, <laughs> unless you've decided to break, well, this is 35 wine bottles worth of broken glass, <laughs> which I broke at my house with a hammer. The first one was exhilarating. <laughs> the second one was fun. The next 33 were less exciting. And the thing that bothers me the most is that none of my neighbors called the police. <laughs> so I'm going to take off my shoes and my socks so we can do this. Um, the thing to think about, it, about this broken glass is that this is a famous carny trick. So if you go to the circus, you'll often see um, or, you know, a late night thing at a movie theater, <laughs> not unlike this, you might see a carny doing this activity. And I've always been so pleased because it's such a nice bit of pressure physics that they were showing off. And so one day I was doing a show not unlike this one and I shared the bill with a carny. He wasn't doing this activity but he had done it in the past, the great Tobias. And so I asked Tobias about it, and he said, Zeke, you don't do it in a very dramatic way. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, I would dance on the broken glass. <laughs> Maybe do a handstand. And I'm like. <laughs> and so, um, I tried to be a little bit more dramatic the next few times I did it from Tobias, for, for Tobias' sake. And then he came and helped me clean up afterwards. And he picked up one of the pieces of glass and he said, Seek, you don't know the secret. <laughs> What's the secret? He said, you take the glass and you tumble it in the dryer for a while. <laughs> And then it ends up like this. It doesn't have any sharp edges left. I said, but I've seen people bleed from it. He said, there are ketchup packets. He said, what did you expect? I was, I'm a carny. And I was like, I've been doing it the wrong way for years. So, so far, I haven't ever bled. Um, let's see how this goes <laughs> right now. <laughs> Is there a playlist? For a second, Sorry? If we pull it back a little bit, can we maybe see it more? We cannot see it. Yeah, that's the hard part. I didn't realize that. Does that make it any better? We can see your You can stand up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why don't you... <laughs> They really want to see your feet bleed, Zeke. Take it back toward the toward farther the back, better? Yeah. Way back, way back, way, way back. back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs>
you hear that crunching noise? It's just the glass. So glass sticks to itself really well. That's where the crunching sound comes from. But you might recognize it from the movies. It's the sound that they make when people walk through snow. And it turns out that's exactly from this. Hey, uh, Luigi, can you give me a hand? Would you yeah. hand me my towel and can I borrow your shoulder? Is that we don't see blood? Uh-huh. There will be blood. <laughs> <laughs> so I need to wipe off my feet. Because the glass likes to stick to them. <laughs> So here's my message. It's possible to arrange things so that they look dangerous and they aren't. That's what the carnies do. Sometimes the things that are even more dangerous can be surprising with them. And then there's some things like walking on broken glass the hard way where everyone can see how crazy stupid I am. (laughs) All right, I'd like to introduce our, uh, oh wait. I'd like to introduce our next uh, uh, illusionist. Um, this is uh, Luigi Enzavino, and he is a neuroscientist who is super interested in the ideas of attention and in learning. And he uh, has been able to combine that as an educator at the Exploratorium, and he wants to help you understand how attention works. Thanks, Zeke. That was fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Let's actually pull this back for a sec. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, First, I thought we could start with a little bit of magic, just so we have a context for what we're going to be talking about with the science of it. Would that that sound okay? Great. Because Zeke was talking about carny games and scams, I thought I'd start with a game that I like to play. It's a con game. It's a scam. Shouldn't play it for money, ever. You might have seen a version of this. Uh, it uses one of these cups and a little ball. I have it here. There you go. Here's what's going to happen. The ball goes in the cup. I shake it up and down, and I'm going to put it in my pocket. Now my goal is to take the ball from the pocket and put it back under the cup without you seeing me do it. So I have to be either really fast or really sneaky so that you won't catch me at it. Are you guys ready to play? Ready to pay attention? No, I I mean the reason why you lose of course is because of misdirection. You, You understand how that works, right? Rule number one, you follow my gaze. So when I do the move, I focus all my attention to the cup. Now everybody's looking at the cup, right? Well, that's a mistake. If you look at the cup, you can't see my hand. You miss the moment it vanishes from here and reappears under there. <laughs> no, it's, it's basic misdirection. Now, if I wanted to take your money, and I do, but I want, I would do this like a betting game. So I'll shake this. I'll do the move close to the, gr- to the table like this, real sneaky. Now, you can't be sure 50-50, right? Pocket or cup. You're nodding yes. What, what would you say, cup or pocket? I'll give you a hint. I would go cup if I were you. <laughs> cup, you're right. You should listen to me. I actually know where the little ball is. <laughs> now, you will learn something is that you can trust me. <laughs> no, you see, I can make you right or I can make you wrong. Even if you see me very clearly, put this ball in my pocket. If you say pocket, guess what? It's going to be in the cup. If you say cup, it's going to be in the pocket because you get it, right? I have two. <laughs> I mean, that's more like a lime. <laughs> I thought maybe you'd catch that. Now, a lot of you at this point are probably asking themselves, where did that lime come from? Well, that's not the right question to ask as an obvious answer, Trader Joe's. <laughs> the question to ask is, how did it fit under the cup? Because of the lemon. Because of the lemon? <laughs> It would be a lot easier if I could fit both of these in the cup, but they don't. So that's a little bit of magic for you guys. 
Yeah. All right, thank you. Now, how did that whole thing work? Well, let's get into it. Uh, so, as Zeke mentioned, I studied neuroscience for many years, and uh, then I learned some magic, and then I thought, well, maybe these two things can be combined into some interesting uh, ideas about the way that we pay attention and we perceive our, our world. And so um, I want to show you just a couple of uh, ideas relating to magic. First of all, I will not be revealing any secrets of magic because there's other magicians in the house and I value my life. <laughs> but probably we will be talking about some interesting things about the way our brain works. So magic, hey, that was very fast. This is sensitive. Magic fools the brain and it fools the mind. When I say it fools the brain, I mean that it fools the way that our brain is wired to perceive the world around us, and we'll talk about that. And when I say that it fools the mind, I mean that it fools the way that our brain is wired to pay attention and process those stimuli that we perceive around the world. And the brain does this for a very good reason. There's a lot of stuff that, that's hitting at us at all times, and we only have limited capacity to pay attention to it all, so the brain takes shortcuts and magicians exploit those shortcuts. For example, perception, we know that perception is an illusion, right? Let me see if I can get this going. <coughs> Through the magic, there you go. You've all probably seen something like this. There is no white triangle in the, on the screen, but you're all seeing one because the picture around it strongly suggests it. And even though now you know that there is no white triangle, you can't help but seeing it. Because our brain is wired that way, no amount of convincing will make you not see that white triangle. So it's an illusion. Most of the stuff that we perceive is an illusion. But why do we feel that way? Well, see, so here's an example of a, a perceptual illusion. I'm going to click this, and it's going to start flashing. There's something in this picture that is changing every time the screen flashes. I want you to raise your hand when you notice what it is. Don't shout it out loud, just raise your hand. There's four people, a few more. Now I'm going to point it out and it's going to be really obvious. See that boat in the middle is appearing and disappearing. <laughs> it's a pretty big change. It's pretty obvious once you know it. But why can't you see it? It's all because of that flash that's in between the images. That brief flash is enough to actually disrupt your whole perception and miss a huge change like that boat coming and going. See, the way that we feel that we pay attention is like a camera would work. Or a clicker could work. <laughs> there you go. Like, n right now I'm looking at you and I feel like the world is in front of me and it's just coming through my eyes like a camera and it's projected in the back of my brain and my brain just picks it up. But that's not at all the way that the brain actually works. To create the, uh, a, a visual percept, what the brain has to do <laughs> is do so much work because the, uh, the cells in our eyes, in our retina, all they know is whether or not this is great. <laughs> Can you just start that presentation right again? <laughs> ah. So I'll vamp for a while. Did you guys know that a group of monkeys is called a troop? Okay, if you guys can hurry up with the thing, because the jokes are not going over too well. <laughs> it's true, though. It's a crash of rhinos. Yeah? A parliament of owls. I'm going to run out of these very soon. A business of weasels. <laughs> a, a what? A business of weasels. A business of weasels. A gam of whales. Oh, very good. Oh, see, I made up my own. Murder of crows. I think, murder of crows, very good. I think a group of uh, teenagers should be called a despondency of teenagers. <laughs> All right, very good. Well, we're back on track. Awesome. So, um, yeah, so cells in the retina only know if they've been hit by light or if in the dark. That's all they know about the world. And then they send that information to a, a part of the brain called V1 where they start picking up whether there are spots of light surrounded by darkness or darkness surrounded by light. So they start detecting contrast. But that's all they know. And they pass that information along. They start detecting direction or motion. But you know, now we're four levels of processing down, and we're still nowhere near the complexity that the brain needs to recognize a face or, or, or your dog. 
So each step of the way is susceptible to mistakes. It takes processing power, and it takes a little bit of time. So with all those three things combined, just a little brief flash is enough to disrupt your perception. So it's so fragile. Likewise, attention. So now, that, now you, you see how that works, right? Now let's think about attention. Attention is also very fragile and also an illusion. Maybe, you, right? So we think when we, look, when we go through the world, we feel like we can pay attention to pretty much everything that's relevant for us. Uh, but that's not the case. And I'm going to show you how that works with a little video. Uh, it won't have sound but you'll be able to see what's going on here. This is uh, one of my favorite performer, yeah. performers. Dan Brown. Dan, Brown. Dan Brown, thank you. My fellow nerds, yeah. I appreciate you. No, no, no. Let's play that movie. Yes. Uh, so here's what he's doing. He's controlling people's mind, um, asking, uh, asking directions, as you can tell. And uh, you'll see in a second, somebody's going to come through with a big object. And uh, he's going to swap out with somebody else. And uh, they just carry on like nothing is happening. They just don't pick up on the chain. It's a pretty big change, wouldn't you say? Um, you can see this one that you can tell. You can see actually how they're doing it. And that painting, by the way, is a painting of Darren Brown. Uh, he's a very talented painter, and he's painted it himself. Uh, no. Like nothing happened. Uh, there's one more, which is this is my favorite. I need to include this every time because it's so outrageous. And it works. Uh, now you're a very smart audience, right? And 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 you understand that this is TV. So they could have filmed this a thousand times, and it only worked three times. And through editing, that's what we're seeing. But we actually know exactly what's going on here because he's presenting this as mind control. But this is a replication of a paper published in 1999 called Failure to Detect Changes to, real, uh, to People in Real World Interaction. This was an attempt to do that thing you saw with the flash, but in a real world scenario. Because in the real world, we don't have a big flash of light that comes in between our vision. And so that's exactly the experiment they did. You can see it's exactly the same thing. So we know, because they interviewed people later on, that 50% of people do not pick up on the change. Right? That's a pretty big number. But then they did the experiment again. And this time, they, they dressed themselves as construction workers. And when they did it that way, the rate of detection went down to 33%. So now, what I want to, you to kind of take in is the fact that and I asked you when I started this presentation, if I were to switch with somebody else right in front of you, would you notice? I think everybody here would say, well, of course I would notice. But under the right circumstances, two thirds of you would miss it. So think about that. The way we pay attention is not the way that we feel we pay attention. So that is helpful when doing magic. Because if I come in front of you and I say, I'm going to do magic for you, you're going to start thinking, well, I want to see what this guy does, but I want to catch him too, right? That's the game you play with a magician. That's always the game. Uh, that actually works to my advantage because I'm putting you in the condition where you're trying to do two things at once. You're trying to follow the effect and the method. And the effect is something cool, like two things fitting into an impossibly small place. The method is something I don't want you to, to catch. So what I do, because you only have limited resources, I make the effect a lot easier and more compelling to follow. And that automatically leaves you with less attention to pay attention to the method. Right? And uh, there's a lot of strategies that magicians have developed over millennia to, uh, to make the effect really compelling to follow. And Robert, who's coming after me, is going to demonstrate them admirably. Uh, but the thing I said about the gaze, follow, your eye following my gaze, is one of them. It's actually true. Right? There is a lot more. And so I get the side effect, side benefit, of you not being able to catch me at my method. This is what magicians actually call misdirection. It's not trying to get you to look away from something, but it's trying to direct your attention in a way that makes sense and uh, is compelling 
and it just works out to our advantage because we're sneaky like that. <laughs> now, I think I've told you everything that you need to know to understand how magic works. So, I'm thinking about maybe showing you one more trick. Yeah. Now, well, thank you for the enthusiasm, but it won't fool you because now you know what, what's going on. <laughs> So I'm just, I'm just trying to entertain, not to fool, okay? I'll need uh, the help of a, of, a, of a volunteer, somebody that could... Wow, that's a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah, you want to come up here? Yes, yeah, sure, you. You, you, you. Oh, I know. Only one person. Let's give her a big round of applause because it's hard being up here. What's your name? I'm Haven. Haven. Nice to meet you. Do you mind uh, being over here where the light is better? Thank you. And uh, do you play cards? Great, that <laughs> works better for me. Take this deck, you can shuffle it if it makes you feel better, or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, and then go through the cards, take out one that you like and hand me the rest. And maybe try to take one with a lot of white space because I want you to write your name on it. So maybe not a picture card, but one that you like. And, and I'll take the rest of the deck when you're done. Great, now I don't wanna see it, but write your name as big as you can on the face of that card. This is the face, right? That's a, if you write on the back, it's considered cheating. <laughs> I found out. <laughs> you are really uptight about those so-called friendly card games. They're not so damn friendly, if you ask me. All right, you got it? Mm -hmm. You won't forget it? No. It doesn't matter because it has your name. Yeah. Now let me show everybody, even the ones in the back. And everybody see the card with Haven's name? It's going back in the middle of the deck. In it goes. Now here's what's going to happen. The card is going to disappear from the deck, travel through the air invisibly, and land in this pocket when I snap my fingers. It's done. <laughs> Empty hand. Yep. <laughs> now you pick the three of spades, right? Three of spades. With your name. Oh, three of clubs. No, yeah, but it has your name, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, you can let it out, it's fine. <laughs> you know what? I lied, I knew it was the three of clubs. Did I tell you I'm a pathological liar? No. It's not really true. <clears throat> no, I tell one lie per performance. That's not pathological, that's like a recidivist. <laughs> now, the second lie is when I told you the card was going to leave the deck invisibly and land in my pocket. That never really happened. You understand this. What happened is the card actually shot up my sleeve, <laughs> went across my chest, shot down into the pocket, and I just had to pull it back out. Yeah. Now that you know how it works, Haven, uh. you can see it happen. It tickles this part. <laughs> right? No hands. And that's how you sign your name? <laughs> yes? Check it. Make sure. Haven, come a little bit closer. Test conditions. I've done it twice. I'll do it one more time. Make sure that is your card with your name. I didn't duplicate it with a little fax machine I have somewhere in my jacket, right? Put it back in the middle of the deck. We'll show everybody for one last time your card. And Haven, when the card disappears and it reappears in my pocket, I'm going to let you pull it out so that it's under test conditions. I'm not even involved in this. Is everybody ready? Yeah. Hasn't left the deck yet. Here it goes. Haven, reach in the pocket and tell them how many cards can you feel in there? One. Take it out, show everybody the three clubs, they'll give you a huge round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not the right card. It's, wait, no, it's not the one. Not, oh, wait, hold on. Did you say there was one card in there, Haven? Card. There was one card when you. Oh, I think I know what happened. I think the whole deck actually went in there, except one card. But that's your card, so <laughs> it works very well. You can keep it. <laughs> Thank you so very much. It is my pleasure to introduce the next performer. He's my good friend. He's performed all over the world. He's performed on national television. He's performed for two presidents and at the California State Prison, which is where we found him. <laughs> so. <laughs> From the White House to the Big House to our house, please welcome my good friend, Robert Strong. 
Actually, let me, should I take this out of here? It'll be good. It'll be good to take this stuff out of here. There you go. Thanks. That was awesome. When the bowling ball hit the ground, you jumped out of your seat. <laughs> Try the decaf. <laughs> I am Robert Strong, and I am a uh, full-time magician. And a big round of applause for Zeke and Luigi. You guys killed it. Nicely done. <laughs> uh, so we are talking about the science of magic, or the, uh, the science of deception. And I want to talk a little bit about it, then I'll do it. Uh, the way magic works is that it works based on assumptions. Your brain is very powerful and through millions of years of evolution, it makes predictions of what comes next. It makes sense out of nonsense. It makes connections to things that aren't necessarily supposed to be connections. Um, it's living in the future. So you make assumptions all the time and some assumptions you might have made is like uh, that watch on my arm is, is a watch. But no, it's blue painter's tape. If you were paying touch, you might have noticed I glanced at it earlier. You might have also uh, uh, assume that my glasses had lenses in them. Uh, they don't, they're just <laughs> hollow and all that. And you also might have assumed that I really did take a sip out of the mug, but it's not, there's actually just some paper in here. There's no drink, I, actually, actually it's, it's just lots of paper. There we go. And that's not something you would expect to see from a coffee mug. <laughs> uh, now, I'd like to uh, do a quick card trick and you, the guy that's a little uh, jumpy, yes. <laughs> what is your name? Alex. That is correct. <laughs> Alex, what do you do for a living? I cook. You cook, no kidding. Uh, a restaurant that we might know? Uh, winery in Let's do a little plug, what winery? Ingle Nook Winery. Ingle Nook Winery, excellent. Um, oh, it might, we don't know if it's good, so don't applaud. Let's <laughs> save it. It's very good, okay, thank you. Um, I have a deck of cards. I'm about to do the world's fastest card trick. Nobody in the world does a faster card trick. Alex, um, I'd like you to name a playing card, any card at all. Say it out loud. Four of diamonds. Now watch it. We move very slowly. No sleight of hand, no misdirection, just real magic. There's one card that's upside down in the stack and it is your card, the four of diamonds. Again, I'll move very slowly. All the cards are face up, but one single card, your card, the four of diamonds. <laughs> Now that could have been luck, so name a different card, Alex. Uh, ace of spades. I stand my fingers. Your card now jumps to the bottom of the deck, and if I get it right, I'll tell you how I do it. There it is, the ace of spades. <laughs> so we're here to learn. Let me tell you the secret. You and Alex talked beforehand. No, no. Did we talk beforehand? Never. No, we did not talk beforehand. The secret is we're using technology. I'm using Bluetooth technology, voice recognition, <laughs> nano 3D printers, and a flux capacitor for the time travel. <laughs> Did we plan anything? No. Okay, good. Um, Alex, uh, as, <laughs> as a thank you, I'm gonna let you roll the dice and get one of six gifts, okay? So will you stand up for this? Give it a shake, shake, shake. Don't lift it up yet. I'll get the, uh, the, the prizes ready. Shake, 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 Alex. And when you're ready, stop. Lift off the red lid and then look at what number you landed on. I'll go ahead and look too. What number? Three. Three. So whatever's behind number three, you get as a gift. Okay. This is exciting. <laughs> Could be a new car. <laughs> Could be movie tickets. Oh boy. Aha! For me! <laughs> Alex, everyone! Thank you, Alex.
Okay, uh, before the show uh, started in the first couple of rows, I gave out little pieces of paper. Uh, take out those little pieces of paper right now, and I want you to notice that I have a little, <laughs> it's like coming out of the bathroom. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I have a little box there next to uh, Zeke's shoes. We'll get to what's in the box in a minute. There's nothing yet. But um, if you have a yellow piece of paper and a pencil, I want you to think of a fruit, keep it a secret, but write it down on that piece of paper. Once you've written it, fold it in half. If you have an orange piece of paper, I want you to think of a dessert, keep it a secret, write it down in the center of that piece of paper, fold it in half. If you've got a green piece of paper, I'd like you to write down an animal, keep it a secret, fold it in half, and uh, write in the middle. So again, if you have a yellow piece of paper, please write down a fruit or vegetable. Uh, if you have orange, please write down a dessert. And if you have a green one, please write down an animal, fold it in half. Uh, was there someone that enthusiastically that wanted to help that didn't get to help earlier? Was there someone? Yeah, you come up here. Come up here, sweaty. Oh, sweetie. Uh, <laughs> a big round of applause for this young lady, it looks like. Yes. Hi, what's your name? Harper. Harper. Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to collect all those pieces of paper, but I want you to do with that box. See the box uh, that's on the ground over there? Yeah? Not, yeah. Have everybody put the folded up half piece of paper in the box, okay? So go collect all those really quickly. And while she's doing that, I'll, I'll tell a little joke. Would you guys like to hear a knock-knock joke or a disgusting joke? <laughs> I think it was kind of even. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll do a, a, a new wave knock-knock uh, joke. You guys start. Who's there? <laughs> orange. I'll tell our orange you. Yes, thank you. Did everybody get it? Did everybody get in there? I'll tell the uh, disgusting joke. Uh, what's green and goes through walls? A frog if you throw it hard enough. <laughs> that was disgusting, I warned you. Okay, thank you. A big round of applause for Harper. Harper, you're very good at following directions. I have a few more directions. Would you unfold uh, the triangles on the side of the box? There's a triangle on each side. Unfold those. There's one on the other side. Then take that red piece of paper and lift it up. Then take that red tab and pull it towards you. And what I want you to do is I want you to quickly pick one green, one orange, one yellow. Ladies and gentlemen, over there I have a prediction before she picks. It's in this manila envelope. Can you pick one green, one orange, one yellow, Harper? This is my prediction. I'm, the envelope's not as big as the prediction. Okay, good. What I want you to do is I want you to read those out loud. Wait, 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 wait. I have predicted an elephant. What's the next one? Orange. An orange? Yes. An orange. Ice cream. Ice cream. And ice cream. Oh. Is that correct? No. No? I thought you said which Oh, which orange color? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a lemon. That's definitely a lemon. <laughs> I, I took the credit for it when she said orange, but that's definitely a lemon. So these are all correct. <laughs> and there's nothing else in the envelope. The envelope is empty. Ice cream. Yeah, and we got them all. A big round of applause for Harper, everyone. Thank you. You can have a seat. Drop them on the ground. So uh, let me tell you uh, how I did this, okay? Because this is a, a descriptive talk. I'm doing this one of two ways. I have uh, had influence throughout this whole 40 minute presentation. If you guys were watching really closely, um, uh, when, oh yeah, when Zeke was on stage, he kept holding up a lemon towel. So you had no other choice but to think of lemon when you were thinking of a, a fruit or vegetable. And I don't know if you noticed, when I walked out, I walked out with an ice cream mug. So you had no choice but to think of ice cream when it was time to think of a dessert. And Luigi? had an elephant on the screen almost the whole presentation. So that's exactly how I did this through influence. <laughs> You're a smart audience. So we may not have done this through influence. We may have just told a story that's one great big. <laughs> I for ice cream, E for elephant, and L for Lemon. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you enjoy the movie. Thank you.